Well, hey folks, good to see you. Welcome to the Daily Evolver Fireside Chat Edition. Um, always enjoy spending a little bit of uh, lazy afternoon, Wednesday afternoons with you. Uh, I wanted to start uh, by sharing actually something on my screen. Yeah, so what this is, is it's a page on the Daily Evolver podcast site, dailyevolver.com. And it's up here in the um, menu bar. And it's, I just wanted to remind you of it. It's something that you might want to bookmark or copy or whatever, but it's a quick intro to integral theory. And um, Namali and I put a lot of time in on it and um, I like it. And I wanted to point out that it's there and um, and particularly to look at the this sort of egg development structure when where one stage grows out of the next and includes it, and that there is a I mean that's the ideal and as you'll see I also have all, every stage is there's lots that we say about it but. Um, down here, four insights to help apply the map to the territory. One of the four insights is that ideally evolution proceeds by transcending previous stages while including them. Practically, we often reject our previous selves as a way of differentiating ourselves from them. For instance, traditionalism rejects magic, modernity rejects religion, and postmodernity rejects objectivity and a lot more. I mean, that's uh, uh, and, and that's really, in a sense, what this uh, episode is about. Um, what the what happens when one stage dissolves the values of the previous stage, and in this case, postmodernity, and how it's you know works to dissolve the values of both modernity and traditionalism. This is its job. This is not a critique in the sense of you know if this shouldn't be happening. It should be happening. From an integral perspective, and that's the last sentence, integral seeks to include the best of all stages. Um, you know, that's what we're here for. That's what we're doing. And so I, I wanted to point that out as a matter of theory uh, and as a way of introducing us to the topic for the day. <laughs> and that is, I want to start by pondering a question that is on the minds of many throughout the land. And that is, how in the hell is Donald Trump running neck to neck with Joe Biden in the polls? And it's something that you know, uh, vexes me and my friends. And so enter David Brooks, big cultural critic, columnist for the New York Times forever. And he writes a column that addresses this. And the column is, big column, op-ed, uh, and the column is, what if we're the bad guys here? How the modern meritocracy made Trump inevitable. inevitable. So I'm going to take a look at that. And then I'm also going to take a look at the column he did a week later called, Hey America, Grow Up. How an epidemic of immaturity swept our land. And... I like David Brooks and I appreciate David Brooks, we'll put it that way. He, and that the New York Times would publish this. What's interesting to me is that it's a critique of progressivism and elitism by a self-identified, certainly elitist. He has his, always had his problems with progressivism, but he's clearly an elite and he, he owns it. And so it's something that I appreciate that, that the New York Times would publish. And it got a lot of stir and, and uh, I think stimulated a lot of good conversation. I want to say I wish it was more integral, but, you know, uh, I, what I'm going to do is try to show how it could be. And yet I still think it's making a big, you know, contribution to cultural evolution. All right. So what if we're the bad guys here? David Brooks, he starts with the question I identified, what's going on with particularly MAGA and conservatives. And he says that the typical liberal answer or story is that Republicans resist change. They want to go back to the 50s when women were in the home, races were segregated, and gays were invisible. And Brooks says, I partly agree with this story 
but it's also a monument to elite self-satisfaction. And then he goes on, so let me try another story on you. I ask you to try to take on, to van take on a vantage point in which we anti-Trumpers are not the eternal good guys. In fact, we're the bad guys. And I love this. I ask you to try on a vantage point. It's, you know, explicit perspective taking. And I, you know, I, I like that. In my one, I guess, critique would be that he goes on to present all downside, all downside of progressivism. But I get that rhetorically, he's, you know, that's what he's doing as a columnist. He doesn't have all day. Uh, and I, sometimes I wonder to what degree he believes it. And this is sort of the little bit of what I play with as I share this with you and look forward to your response and your take on it. So anyway, he writes, the story begins in the 1960s when high school graduates had to go off to fight in Vietnam, but the children of the educated class got college deferments. It continues in the 1970s when the authorities imposed busing on working class areas of Boston, where they bust kids across town, black kids to white schools, white kids to black schools, but did not do this in the up upscale communities like Wesley, where they themselves lived. Members of our class are always publicly speaking out for the marginalized, but somehow we always end up building systems that serve ourselves. The most important of those systems is the modern meritocracy. I love this, you know, taking, right, taking it on. We built an entire social order that sorts and excludes people on the basis of the quality that we possess most, academic achievement. Highly educated parents go to elite schools, marry each other, work at high paying professional jobs and pour enormous resources into our children who get to go to the same elite schools, marry each other and pass on their exclusive class privileges. And then he goes on to talk about different uh, par par parts of the world and he talks about journalism. He says, for instance, journalism is an elite college-dominated profession. And he points out that less than 1% of the population at large goes to elite universities. Yet more than 50% of the staff writers at the beloved New York Times and Wall Street Journal have gone to those schools. He says, elite graduates monopolize the best jobs and at the same time, invent new technologies that make the best jobs better and all other jobs worse. Armed with all kinds of economic, cultural, and political power, we support policies that help ourselves. Free trade makes products we buy cheaper, and yet our jobs are unlikely to be moved to China. Open immigration depresses wages, not for us, but for them. Like all elites, we use language and mores as tools to recognize one another and exclude others. Using words like problematic, cisgender, Latinx, and intersectional is a sure sign that you got cultural capital coming out of your ears. Meanwhile, members of the less educated classes have to walk on eggshells because they never know when they, we've changed the rules so that something they, that was sayable five years ago now gets you fired. We also changed, and this is important and really helped me think about, you know, it's so invisible when you're living the values of modernity and post-modernity to see what it's doing to the previous stages. As, you know, as I said, it's just part of evolution. We do that. But he goes on, he writes, we also change the moral norms in ways that suit ourselves, never mind the cost to others. For example, there used to be a norm that discouraged people from having children outside of marriage, but that got washed away during our period of cultural dominance, as we eroded norms that seemed judgmental or that might inhibit individual freedom. 60% of births to women with only 60% of births to women with only a high school certificate occur out of wedlock, compared with only 10% to women with a university degree. That matters because the rate of single parenting is the most significant predictor of social immobility in the country. 
After this social norm was eroded, a funny thing happened. Members of our class still overwhelmingly married and had children within wedlock. People without our resources, unsupported by social norms, were less able to do that. And there, that's it. You know, that is how post-modernity, you know, what I would argue is it's a stage of human history that had to happen. I mean, we can do it more or less skillfully, but there's a downside as we dissolve the value systems of the previous. And there's an upside where there's a whole new territory of consciousness and culture that comes online. And so that's, again, integral. We want to transcend and include, not transcend and exclude. And Brooks plays around with it. I mean, he is, um, I, want, I sometimes want to say he's proto-integral. I'm not sure because he doesn't really get development, it seems to me. And certainly not any spirit of development uh, or evolution. But he does get the self-critique that has to happen for integral to happen. So... Anyway, from an integral perspective, I think we can see that traditionalists are uh, reacting against the previous system that they're emerging from, which is the red system, which is chaos, disorder. So they don't want that. They're looking to create civilization where people can find meaning in an ordered universe with maybe God at the top or something like that. To them, free love does not sound like progress. It feels like going back to the scene before the Moses came down from the uh, mountain with the, you know, where they're all with the golden calf and they're all having that kind of 1950s orgy. It's so funny. Anyway, people at traditionalism who are, you know, reacting against red values want to feel like they live in a good, stable country where they can find a place. They don't want critical theory. They want to believe, you know, and modernity disenchanted life. You know, as I often point out, post-modernity killed truth in any kind of an absolute sense. And to go on with Brooks here, he says, it's easy to understand why people in less educated classes would conclude, conclude that they are under economic, political, cultural, and moral assault. And that's why they've rallied around Trump as their best warrior against the educated class. Trump understood that there was a great demand for a leader who would, who would stick his thumb in our eyes on a daily basis and reject the whole epistemic regime that we rode in on. So, there you go. So, um, I, I like it. I, again, I think he's uh, particularly... Uh, identified or, you know, identifying the negative aspects of these new stages coming online, but it is where we're at and becomes invisible to those of us who are on the winning side of that. I'm not sure his com comment or his um, column got through to the New York Times readers, however, because if you go to the comments section, and this is the reader's choice. So these are the comments that the readers ranked. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to go through the first, I think, five uh, quickly. Uh, number one comment. Rural folks complain about crummy jobs and low pay, but refuse to support unions. They complain about poor schools and lack of opportunities while refusing to pay for good teachers and vilifying them. It's hard to feel sympathy for narrow-minded, resentful people who can't recognize who's really on their side. And, you know, it's always fun to notice how many arguments consist of finding the flaws in the other side argument from your perspective. It's never that hard to do. You know, it's like, why do these people refuse to see what I see? They're stupid, they're bad, they're co-opted, you know, there's something wrong with them. And that's a lot of these comments. Uh, comment number two, as a woman whose bodily autonomy, autonomy has been taken away by conservatives, I get really tired of being told that I just need to be more empathetic. I never, ever see pleas for rural conservatives voters to be more empathetic to my situation. I never see them tr trying to understand my perspective or what might be keeping me up at night. And yes, uh, integral does require that you take the perspective of others who are unwilling to take yours. 
So, you know, and actually at integral, in a sense, you don't have a perspective like you used to. You have a space that is able to include and see and evaluate and, you know, uh, embrace previous worldviews. So that is a whole different sort of ball game. Anyway, comment three, race plays a much bigger role in their attraction to Trump than class. Uh, if demographics weren't changing so much, they wouldn't care what college educated folks were doing. Fair enough. I think that's part of it. Uh, and then uh, this next guy, he quotes Brooks in saying that this story begins in the 1960s when high school grads had to go off to fight in Vietnam, but the children of the educated class got college deferments. And then this guy goes on to say, such as Donald Trump, who got a deferment, which renders the rest of this essay meaningless. <laughs> <laughs> and then the fifth comment is, this blew my mind in a way. It says, don't tell me what a swell president Trump was, especially today. And, uh, you know, I would just, uh, you know, there, there's a line that Brooks writes in this column. This is it verbatim. Trump is a monster in the ways we've all been saying for years and deserves to go to prison. So how they came to that, what a swell president Trump is, I don't know. All right. So then let's just take a quick look at the second column, and that is, Hey America, Grow Up, How an Epidemic of Immaturity Swept Our Land. And it starts <laughs> with a great line. He says, if I were asked to trace the decline of the American psyche, isn't that something? The decline of the American psyche, it's just a religious belief of the uh, intelligentsia you know it's it's certain a certainly a religious belief of green of every first tier meme in the sense has some story about how the world is going to hell uh until we integral where we see that we have come up from eden and every stage of development has its dignities and disasters thank you ken wilbur but anyway david brooks if i were to ask to trace the decline of the American psyche, I suppose I would go to a set of cultural changes that started directly after World War II and built over the next few decades. The emergence of what came to be known as the therapeutic culture. And I like that he uses that term. I've been using it for years. It's a, one of the ways of describing green. And in a way, modernity too. Um, and he goes on. In earlier cultural epochs, and I like that. There you go. Epoch, cultural epochs. Many people derived their self-worth from their relationship with God, that's a traditionalist, or from their ability to be a winner in the commercial marketplace. You'd think he'd been reading Ken Wilber here. But in a therapeutic culture, people's self of, sense of self-worth depends on their subjective feelings about themselves. Do I feel good about myself? Do I like me? Well, what I would say about the therapeutic culture is it does introduce the realm of subjectivity in a way that has ne never been online in the cosmos, as far as we know. So there is that. But I'll go back to Brooks here. He says, plagued by anxiety, depression, vague discontents, a sense of inner emptiness. Yes, absolutely. The psychological man of the 20th century seeks neither individual self-aggrandizement nor spiritual transcendence, but, get this, peace of mind under co conditions that increasingly militate against it. I wouldn't argue with that, um, but I think it's a worthy fight to, you know, or a worthy challenge to find peace of mind under conditions that increasingly militate against it. And, um, you know, again, evolutionarily speaking, the therapeutic culture is the first person dimension of the movement into postmodernity, where new territory is created, this whole realm of uh, subjectivity, a new awareness of our own interiority, radically free from the hand of God or good or evil spirits. Um, and then, you know, that's the modern sort of insight creating a lot of anxiety, that the age of anxiety. And then the postmodern move is sort of a mass introspection as we begin to take on and expand to include the interiority of others. 
and the collective karmas and as aspects relatedness, power dynamics, all of it. And um, and that is the postmodern move. It's depressing in a way because we are not really allowed to believe in anything. Uh, and he goes on to describe sort of the downsides of that. And I think he's right on. And I think it's a great column and it's going to do good. But he, and here's what he said. For instance, he says, social media became a place where people went begging for attention, validation and affirmation, even if they often found rejection instead. Uh, this was accompanied by what you might call the elephantiasis of trauma. Once the word trauma referred to brutal physical wounding one might endure in a war or through abuse. But usage of the word spread, spread so that it was applied across a range of unsettling experiences. A mega best-selling book about trauma, The Body Keeps Score, became the defining cultural artifact of the era. Um, he talks about the new New Yorker column or article that's getting a lot of attention called The Case Against the Trauma Plot which notes how many characters in novels, memoirs, and TV shows are trying to recover from psychological trauma, from Ted Lott Lasso on down. In January 2022, Vox declared that trauma had become the word of the decade, noting that there were over 5,500 podcasts with the word in the title, which I have contributed to, to I don't know how many. Anyway, he goes on, for many people, trauma became their source of identity. People began, began defining themselves by the way they had been hurt. It was the notion that what doesn't kill you makes you weaker, inducing people to look at the wounds in their past and feel debilitated, not stronger. Um, and I do think that that's the misuse of trauma therapy and realization. But again, no upside. I don't expect them to write this. I'm just saying that an integral perspective would in, would note that trauma comes from the realization that we have an energetic body that somehow enmeshed with our minds. I don't know exactly how it works, but part of our own maturation is about contacting and experiencing this body, which you know has a karmic history of cause and effect. And to experience the stuck points without resistance or preference or give it over to God or whatever word you want to use. And that as we do that, there's more space to live in and there's more energy that's freed and territory available to us. And of course, as Ken Wilbur points out, there's more that can go wrong in a new, more, more complex world. Welcome to evolution. As um, uh, I, I, I may be mangling this, but I remember he would say something like, beetles don't get cancer, but dogs do. And that's the down, you know, every new stage brings on new complexity of problems and keeps, evolution likes keeping us on edge. I mean, I hate to say it, but it's true. Anyway, he talks about this in terms of moving into an immaturity of culture. Uh, where we're impulsive, dramatic, erratic, and cruel. Yeah, uh, you know, but try history. But, but anyway, he says, in institution after institution, from churches to schools to nonprofits, the least mature voices dominate and hurl accusations, while the most mature lie low trying to get through the day. I think that's right. Uh, if we're going to build a culture in which it is easier to be mature— we're going to have to throw off some of the tenets of the therapeutic culture. And I would say we have to throw out one tenet of the therapeutic culture. And it's the same tenet we have to throw off with every worldview. And that is the idea that it's the only true one, <laughs> that it's the only worldview that is valuable. And once we do that, then the rest comes pouring in. And he kind of describes some of the fruits of that. He he moves into his idea of maturity, which I think does have a lot of integral sensibility. And uh, to quote him, he says, maturity now as ever is understanding that you're not the center of the universe. The world isn't a giant story about me. I would like to add the hero's journey into that, but I'm not going to quibble. Okay. 
Maturity in this alternative ethos is achieved by getting out of your own selfish point of view and developing the ability to absorb, understand, and inhabit the view of others. Yeah, man. In a non-therapeutic ethos, people don't build secure identities on their own. They weave their stable selves out of their commitments to and attachments with others. Okay, second person. Their identities are forged as they fulfill their responsibility as friends, family members, employees, neighbors, and citizens. Yes, exactly. And I think there is a real uh, a re-realization of that. Uh, he says the process is social and other absorbed, not therapeutic. Um, fine. Um, and that's right. I think, you know, there's there's definitely the non-therapeutic um, worldviews that need to be included, uh, but I would call them trans-therapeutic, not non-therapeutic. Again, we want to transcend and include. He goes on, he says, mature people are calm amid the storm because their perception lets them see the present challenges from a long-term vantage. Yes, the bigger the perspective, the more one can appreciate the goodness, truth, and beauty that is being created by evolution and created in your own life. So I love that. And, and then he finishes with, they know that feeling crappy about yourself sometimes is a normal part of life. Yep. They are considerate too and gracious towards others because they can see situations from multiple perspectives. Yes. They can withstand the setbacks because they have pointed their life towards some concrete moral goal. And I wouldn't argue with that either. All right, so that's David Brooks and his two columns that have gotten a lot of attention. And, you know, that's some of what I think about them. And I really uh, appreciated them. And um, I uh, would be very interested in hearing what you folks think about that. So to prime the pump, we will go into small groups. What, 12, 15 minutes? Mm -hmm. uh, just how do you see this? this um the therapeutic culture the um the sort of invisible privilege of the meritocracy and uh his critique of progressives uh and you know what does this provoke in you well welcome back everybody uh and um yeah i'd love to hear what you have to say and uh think about this crazy David Brooks and all his ideas. And I got a good question, actually, from Arthur. And Arthur, I'd invite you to just, uh, I don't know if you want to do video, but open your audio and ask it again for everybody. I thought it was really good. Yeah, um, my question was, um, how do we meet people at different stages and come to more of a higher integral view? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, this is the practice, and we do it um, not necessarily to be successful, because practice is always something that we're sort of falling off the wagon, and but then we bring ourselves back. And it's the uh, practice of perspective taking. It really is. I mean, which doesn't mean just how do you think, but how do you feel? How, how can you be with somebody and actually let their energy in and not be, you know, normally if we're operating from our own worldview, other worldviews are very, very threatening, and we want to explain them away. And we, you know, in all the ways I talked about that, you know, this shouldn't be happening at all. It's awful that it is. Somebody has to be blamed. And to actively resist that. And you can do that as a practice by, you know, turning on Fox News and listening to somebody talk, you know, that you might not agree with or the other way around. Uh, and to be curious instead of critical. Instead of how could they say that? It's like, how could they say that? What world do they live in where that makes sense? And that they're actually coming from good faith and goodwill. And, you know, I think if you just do that as a practice, you sort of figure it out. So that'd be my take on it. Any comments or anybody else? I'd be happy to. I think to... the opposite is more difficult. How can they understand us? Because we can try to understand them. We have the understanding of multiple perspective and anything they don't. Yeah. So for them, their perspective is the only one and we are wrong, period. Totally. So. No, that's right. And so how do we take the perspective of other people who are unwilling to take ours? 
Now that's that's not easy, but you know you can. Uh, that that doesn't mean you can't prescribe inf- uh, behavior that is unhealthy to the whole group, and we have to we have to fight. We have to get in the arena with people as well. But to expect them to, you know, it's like with a kid. You know, they you're the, the the more evolved person is the one who's more responsible for taking the perspective of the other person. So that's I think a good way of looking at it. Okay, anybody else? Is it like first seek to understand then to be understood? Yes. Yes. That was Saint Francis, right? I think the Saint Francis prayer, let, let me seek to understand rather than be understood. Yeah, it's a good one. And and Stephen Covey and Stephen Covey, yeah, yeah, no, that's a that's a good one, and it's fun. If I, you know, if I'm at the Thanksgiving table with all my redneck relatives, I can have a ball. I mean, it's just such a trip, you know. And I actually know where they're coming from, and they're the people David Brooks is talking about, and their way of life is gone, uh, and their kids are, you know, some of them are sort of reverted to red. You know, and they're just not able to take care of themselves. And there's and there's a way in which people who are traditional, when they're looking at the modern world, and it's like we're asking them to enter this world where we use logic and we sit in cubicles and we have to put things in spreadsheets and we have to follow a clock. Uh, people who are at a traditional and sometimes even a pre-traditional uh, worldview uh, or stage of development, they not only can't do that, they don't want to. And they should be able to live in a world. There ought to be, a, there, there has to be, a, this is the interval project or the project of humanity next, is to find out how can we create a space for red, for one thing. You know, I think of, uh, I was just thinking of him the other day, a kid I grew up with. He was a couple years older than me. I rode the bus with him. We lived out in the country. We had a school bus that took us, you know, half hour each way. And he, before school, would go out trapping minks and muskrats and that sort of thing. And he would check his traps and then he would skin these poor animals, you know, and he would sell their hides. And that's what he, that's what he lived for. And he hunted, and and then he would get on the school bus early, seven thirty, eight o'clock in the morning, seven thirty, I think. And he'd sit in the back seat and just be like with his arms folded and just looking straight ahead. He had nothing to say to anybody. I don't think he ever, you know, I don't. I think he was in the dumb class, you know, which we talk about segregating people according to intelligence. I mean, I went to a school where there was the A class, the B class, the C class, the D class, and the E class. And that 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 was structured according to how you uh, scored on a test. I think it was probably accurate in a certain way. Uh, but I always felt bad for the kids in the E class, you know. And a lot of them, they just weren't suited to the world of modernity. And uh, you know, and so this guy who I'm talking about, he was, you know, he had his friends and they they did you know, horseplay, and he wasn't completely t- tuned out. Uh, and he was good looking. He had a lot of, you know, girlfriends and that sort of thing. But he ended up as, you know, one of the statistics that we talk about as he got into drugs and died young uh, with some sort of drug poisoning that happened to so many of the people in my neck of the woods. So, you know, I don't know how that works or what we do. There's there's ways now, of course, you know, sports, uh, I think, um, you know, David Brooks talks about in another article that he just wrote for The Atlantic. He's just been on fire lately, this David Brooks, about uh, a compulsory um, public service uh, that would be similar to the military, that all young people would go or there would be some way in which there would be a compulsory uh, public service phase of one's life. And, you know, maybe some exceptions, but that sort of thing. Maybe we think about that. Uh, going out in the wilderness, making that just a part of an initiation of, you know, p- people as they move into a certain age. There's a lot of this stuff we can actually re- mine from the past. And, you know, if you think about tribal earlier societies, there were initiation, you know, often trials that were, uh, you know, you would earn your adulthood. And I think, you know, a lot of people are experimenting with that sort of thing for sure. And um, I'm all for it. 
All right, Karen. Yeah, rich, rich thread. Uh, yes, uh, uh, on the responsibility of the people who are at the later arising, I, I really am still struggling to find terms for this for the stages that have no value loading whatsoever. And that's part of our job, because we're not there yet. But I call them the later arising stages have the greater responsibility. And to the points you were just making, Jeff, one of the ideas that I'm tinkering with is the idea of the basic minimum income, some way to see that every person, every, every living being has a, at least a very basic minimum level, you know, housing, um, food, medical care, education, and access to help that will help them find whatever their groove in light might, life might be, whatever ways they can contribute, or if they're really incapable, then at least they're supported. Cer a certain floor through which nobody falls below. Yep. I think that's because I really take your point, and Brooks, that some people, a lot of people are simply not capable of functioning right. at the level it takes to make a middle class income in this society. That, that needs to change. But then stepping back in a broader sense about the issue of responsibility to the points that Tamar and Arthur were making, I'm thinking, of um, Jung. Uh, I did a lot of reading in Jung back in the 90s. And uh, in one of his letters, late in life, uh, somebody wrote Jung a letter uh, saying, and I forget the terms, but it was with some some resentment saying, boy, I just wish I had as much insight as you have, with the, the, the context being that life would be a lot easier for those of us who don't have the depth of insight you do. And it was there, there, there was some ill will there. And Jung just let him have it. This was late in life, and he was kind of slipping the reins a bit. And Jung just unleashed and said, do you have any any idea how hard it is to have the deep with the deeper insight comes responsibility it does not make life easier it makes life more complicated and it burdens you with a much greater level of responsibility so you was getting it off his chest but to that point those of us who do putatively inhabit these later arising stages i mean we are capable in many ways uh, that don't exist in form. We, they, I mean, we the levels of self-regulation. As I as I under parse the stages these days, there are certain uh, capacities to self-regulate at more and more sophisticated, complex levels. Mm -hmm. Those who thrive at each stage is, have mastered the need to self-regulate at this new phase. And those who are going to thrive in the cultures of today and tomorrow, we're going to have to learn to self-regulate where we put our attention because of social media and so on. So that's, mm -hmm. but. Um, uh, I, I, I want to wrap up here that the the response this is the responsibility and I think that's my general point the people who the 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 later the the more hmm, to put this in a term in terms that has absolutely no value loading I mean this is part of our challenge now yeah. how can we talk about stages talk from stages talk across stages and have no no emotional value laid to come out with a set of concepts and terms this is part of our responsibility now and part of our challenge. Yeah. I'll stop there. Oh, very good. Yeah, I mean, I think of the younger generation who are just so much more egalitarian. I mean, they just can't tolerate the kind of um, you know inequalities and so forth, and that's that's good. You know, that's uh, that's and and there's a new responsibility in a sense where the circle of people who I have to care about is ever bigger. Until finally at Green, you become world centric in a certain way, you know, uh, and you certainly are tuned to the people who have been left behind by the previous stages and all of that good stuff. And that that is an arising of responsibility, even though it's not necessarily, you know, skillfully used or, you know, applied, but it's just happening under its own power. Yes. So, Eric. Yes. Hello, everyone. So I want to tag on a couple of things that have been brought up. So Karen, thank you for, you know, bringing up the responsibility side of that, that those of us who are seeing from these, um, you know, hopefully wider perspectives have a responsibility for how we bring that in. So it takes me back to communication, which seems to be a theme. Wow, my screen keeps popping around. Where'd you go? Okay, Jeff, when you were talking about the reader responses to David Brooks, and you listed five of those and the negative things that are creating these antibodies. So a curiosity for me is how do we take concepts that are coming from, you know, later stage 
you know, circles that we inhabit and then translate them so that they're actually accessible to people. And how, you know, like how might we rewrite, you know, what David Brooks wrote? And in your commentary, Jeff, you're sort of doing that. But what's the what's the piece that gets out there to the public or Karen, as you mentioned, you know, basic minimum income? I would imagine that people at a certain vantage point are not going to see anything good about that because the nuances of higher stages are just not available. And so they all, all they're going to see is government giveaway. It's like, why not get a job just like me? I'm out there working my butt off. You lazy butts are trying to fund, you know, trauma <laughs> therapy yeah, or something like therapy. that. So, you know, it's, there's a responsibility that I would say people like us in this group have for how do we communicate better in ways that people at these, you know, different altitudes are going to understand according to, you know, meeting them where they are. I think that's, you know, possible, but, you know, how to do that, what's, you know, what's the granular detail of how do, how do we actually do that so we can be effective and fulfill that sense of, you know, responsibility that arguably we have uh, where we're situated? Well, you know, the one thing that comes to mind for me, Eric, and it's such a good question, of course, is that, you know, it's it's kind of like marriage counseling. When the other person really gets that you get what they're talking about, then you can, at that point, and only at that point, when they agree that you get where they're coming from, then you can say what you have to say. You can you know, put your piece in. And that's, I think, you know, our, one of our jobs is to be able to articulate their point of view as well as they can and feel it, you know, feel the energetic of it. Uh, like the, the basic income. There's that part that we don't want to facilitate be, people being on the couch. We see what even happened with COVID. On the other hand, it's intolerable that there would be a baseline that isn't decent for every person in this country. You know, both of those are true, but you, you know, you, you got to make sure they know that you get where they're coming from. Uh, and then you can, it's, it's like the old, what was, what was it? I, I'm trying to think of these old career track things, but never, never mind. It's, it's, uh, I, I, that, that's where I sort of go with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, appreciating to what Arthur brought in earlier about, you know, seek first to understand, which maybe yeah. St. Francis, but also Stephen Covey popularized that as well. And I think of uh, other folks like, um, is it Ryan Nakade with his steel man and titanium mm -hmm. man? And it's like, how do we help people to feel seen not only by getting their argument as they understand it, but even taking it up to another level to say like, and here's what's really good about it. And that as we build that for the other, then that's going to, you know, attract some ears. It's like, wow, how did you, you know, I love that. You, yeah. So, Hey, Wheaton. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm a hierarchy. I'm, I'm thinking back to uh, when I was in college and LBJ uh, came out with a work, uh, work core modeled after Peace Corps. And it's uh, a, a way you could um, uh, get free education at a level that you want to get at, uh, supposedly. And uh, he recruited me and other, other college kids to go into homes where the, the income was low and the, the, some data said that there was a kid around our age that didn't have education and possibly not a, not a, a decent job. And I, I've been thinking back at, at the incongruity of that, driving into, into uh, it was a country place, driving into the farmhouses and in our MGs and our, our nice little cars and our pretty little outfits and, you know, telling them that you could be better than you are. And, you know, and it's, it's very open hearted, very, very well meaning, but nobody ever said anything about, why don't you listen a little bit? Why don't you go in there and ask them how their life is? Yeah. You know, why don't you spend a little time uh, uh, seeing the world from their point of view and then give them this nice thing? And uh, it's just, it's kind of incongruous. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you're not just doing it, you know, manipulatively. You no. know, you, you come to the, with the assumption that they're seeing something that you're blind to. I actually want what you have and I'm going to, you know, value it. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that's different than tolerance. That's appreciation. And I, I, I think yeah. it's a good distinction. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Nice. 
All right. Thanks. We, uh, well, let, me just, let me just share a little quick, real quick. Uh, so, so Susan Cook Reuter talks about so much of our early life and, and to adulthood is getting on, moving on, moving up, uh, putting new things on. And at some point you start saying, well, you know, to get to do what I want to do, I, I need to get rid of some stuff. And, it, you know, once, once we start getting rid of some stuff, we yeah. can maybe be humble enough to learn learn other people's point right. of view. And certainly get rid of the grip that anything else has on us. So we might want the gifts of everything, but we don't want to be gripped by anything. Good. Yeah, and thanks. So it's such a delight. You know, then there's that simplicity beyond complexity. It's like, I don't have to hold every perspective. I just have to have the space that will accommodate perspectives when they arise from other people, from myself, you know, notice my native perspective, notice, you know, my knee jerk, knee -jerk perspective, uh, and don't be gripped up by any of it. Something like that. Arthur, we'll finish up with Arthur and then uh, that'll be it. Yeah, um, I don't see it as one person or government that's going to change everything. Um, I see, I like what, or I think it's a responsibility of everybody to figure out, oh, they see a problem and how they're going to help it, like with service. And I like what Ken Wabber says about there's an urgency now, no excuses. As wisdom holders, we need to help people find what's important to grow up by moving through the early stages of emotional maturing, cleaning up by doing the shadow work, waking up by doing a spirit, by doing spiritual practice and showing up by serving humanity in the world. Yeah, right on. Well said. Yeah, the waking, growing up, and showing up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, thank you, Ken Wilbur. Uh, I mentioned him a few times today. I appreciate, uh, always appreciate him so much. Uh, so anyway, thank you, gang. I'm not going to be here two weeks from now, so I won't be here on the 6th, but I'll be back on the 20th. I'm going to do some traveling. And so I'll see you in a month. And I hope you rejoin and um, have a good month and uh, take care of yourself and keep it integral. Bye.